family, and welcome back to Wisdom for Life. My name is Brittany, and I'm so happy to be with you in your homes. Now we are heading towards one of the greatest times of the year, where we get to celebrate what Jesus has done for us. Now this week, my dad will be sharing on Passover and just how special this time of year is. Let's enjoy. What is eternal life? How many of you today believe you have eternal life? Can I see your hand? Well, if I asked you if you have eternal life, we have a confidence in our hearts to lift our hands and say, I believe I have eternal life. But if I had to take my microphone and give it to each and every person here and say, describe eternal life. What is eternal life? What is it that you just lifted your hand for? Because you said you have it. And I believe we'll get a whole lot of answers. I don't think any of them would be wrong, not in this house, because we know the Word of God. And sometimes we can get lost in all the information. We lose the impact of what it really is. Some people may say, well, it means we're going to live for eternal. <laughs> That's what eternal life is. For all eternity, we'll live. That is true. Or it means I'll go to heaven when I die. That is true. You say, because Jesus is my Lord and Savior. That is true. All these things are true. But what truly is eternal life? John chapter 10, we've been studying it for some time now. Verse 10, Jesus said, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus says the reason he came was so that we could have life and have that life more abundantly. Why did Jesus come to the earth? He described it in many different places, and he said, for this purpose the Son of Man has come, to destroy the work of the enemy. For this purpose I have come, to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus identified different reasons that he came. He said, I have come not to judge the world, but to save the world. So we see Jesus came for our salvation. He came to pay the price. He came for a reason. And all of those reasons were culminated on the day of that Passover when he died on that cross as the replacement lamb. He was the lamb. The lamb that died in sacrifices was a type and shadow prophesying that Jesus would be the lamb that takes away all the sin of the world. And so in everything that he says that he came for, that he came to destroy the work of Satan, came to seek and save that which is lost, he came to save the world and all of that, he also said, I came that you may have life and have that life more abundantly. What is abundant life? Well, usually when we think of abundant life, the first thing that we think of is the thing we don't have. You see, when I recognize that I have enough of happiness or enough of a family or enough of a job or enough of a home or enough food, it's not like I have any needs in my life. It's usually the things I don't need. We've got to be very cautious that our serving of God doesn't become a tradition, a religion of just crying out when we have a need. Just in my lack, I need God. Because abundant life talks about more than just provision. It talks about life. I came that you may have life. Everybody say life. life. And that you may have that life more abundantly. So evidently, whenever I think I'm involved with life, there's more. There's more to life that Jesus gave us. So what is this life that we're talking about? You come forward a few chapters, John chapter 14. John chapter 14, and verse 6. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the way, not an alternative way, not one of many ways. Sometimes you will hear people say that all roads lead to Rome. At the end of the day, we're all serving God. Jesus said, I am the way. The way. Everybody say, the way. the way. I am the truth. Not one of the truths. Not an alternative philosophy. Not just a way of thinking. He is the truth truth. Everybody say, the truth. the truth. And he says, I am the life. The life. There is no life outside of Jesus. In our natural languages, we use the concept of a heart beating and breathing oxygen through our lungs as life. As long as the organism continues to exist, we'll call that life. But really, that is one word that would detract from what Jesus was saying when he said he is the life. Life is more than just existing. Life is more than survival. And in that statement of saying, I have come that you may have life and have life more abundantly, he says he is the way, he is the true, he is the life. And he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Every single human ever created will meet their maker. Everybody will stand before God. Even those that have denied him will stand before him. And I don't know about you. I want to know that if Jesus paid the supreme price and God judged him and judged him for all sin and then justified me, I do not want to stand before the judge. When I look at what sin did to Jesus on the cross, the Bible said it marred him so much that you could not recognize him as a man. After carrying every single sin of the human race, every sickness, every disease, every curse that the enemy could possibly throw at mankind, Jesus bore it all. And then the Bible says that when Jesus died that cross, people thought he was being punished for having blasphemed God. But he says he was stricken for our iniquities. When you see the judgment of God poured out in Jesus, I do not want to stand before God as a judge. How many you say amen to that? There's a story that is told to illustrate this. It was a young man who had a motorbike and his father was the judge in the city. And this young man thought because his father was the judge, he could do anything he wanted. And he would take his motorbike and he would go screaming down the main road, breaking all speed limits, driving recklessly. And news got to the father. And the father said, son, you must understand, I am a judge. If you're caught, I'm going to have to find you. I'm going to have to judge you. And he laughed it off. And one day he was speeding and they trapped him. And he had to appear before the judge. And because the limit was so bad, he'd broken it so badly, the sentence was very heavy. And the father, the judge, listened to the case. And he came to the end and he said, you have been found guilty. And I fine you 100,000 rand or a year in prison. And the son broke down. He said, Dad, Dad, I can't. I, you know I can't. I don't have 100,000 rand. I don't want to go to prison. And the father said, the judgment is made. The son broke down. He thought his father hated him. He couldn't understand it. He thought his father loved him because his father was a loving person at home. Always encouraged him, helped him. And he broke down. And when he looked up through the tears of his eyes, his father was standing in front of him. And he said to him, son, up there, I'm your judge. I had to judge you guilty. But down here, I'm your father. And here's the check for 100,000 rand. Don't speed again. 
The question is, who do you want to stand in front of? The, we'll all be standing in front of the judge one day. But I want him looking through the eyes of knowing that I am his son. And I accepted the full price of Jesus. That even though I may be judged guilty in my sin, he can judge me innocent, paid in full. Because up there he may be my judge. But with me, he is my father. And Jesus said, no one comes to the father except through Jesus. How many want to stand in front of your father one day when he looks at all that we are? And so when we talk about this eternal life, what is eternal life? We see Jesus meeting, as we saw in that cute video, in the upper room with his friends, his disciples. And they're having what he, we've come to call the Last Supper. The Last Supper really was the covenant meal. It's the Passover meal that God had instituted for the Jewish people to celebrate year after year after year at that exact time when he had come into Egypt and all those that had uh, tried to keep the Egyptians bondage, God, uh, the, the Israelites bondage, God had said, let my people go. He arranged for Moses to deliver them. And as you know, Pharaoh didn't allow that. Through various plagues, eventually it came to the place where he had to make sure that they would be let go. And then God decreed that the angel of death was going to pass through Egypt and that every firstborn of every family would die. But those that would take the blood of a lamb and paint it on the doorposts, that even when that angel of death came past, if it saw the blood, everybody say the blood. When they saw the blood, that angel would pass over that house. That's where the word Passover comes from. He would pass over that house. And so all the Jews who had sacrificed the lamb and painted that blood on their posts were saved that night. And they had to move very quickly when the next day, Pharaoh said, that's it, everybody get out, Jews take everything you got and leave the city. They had to move very, very quickly. And God instituted this meal where they would eat from this unleavened bread. The unleavened bread has so many prophetic meanings to it. I'm not going to teach on it today because leaven speaks of sin, speaks of things that will influence our lives against the kingdom of God. But it also speaks of that when they baked their bread, they had to bake it in a way that they couldn't wait for it to rise and then still bake it. It had to move very quickly to get out of Egypt. And so that's where the concept of the unleavened bread came from. And then, of course, the, the wine, the fruit of the vine, the grape juice, in order to establish the covenant that God had sworn with the children of Israel to protect them. We know that every covenant is sworn in a covenant meal. And so year after year, the disciples raised as Jewish boys and then Jewish men would sit and enjoy this covenant meal. And Jesus made a decision that they're going to enjoy this meal together. And it says in Mark chapter 14, verse 22, as they were eating, Jesus took bread blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. This is my body. For years they'd eaten that bread without even knowing what it meant. And Jesus said, This is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Everybody say, new covenant. new covenant. And so year after year, they were eating this meal, eating bread, drinking the wine, and without realizing it, were celebrating that Jesus' body would be broken on the cross, and that His blood would be shed to cleanse us from all sin. And so as He ate the meal, He lifted that bread and said, Now, my friends, this is why we've been eating it. This is so that you can remember me even when I'm gone. Eat this bread in remembrance of me. This is my body. This cup signifies my blood 
of the new covenant. Assuredly, I say to you, verse 25, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So Jesus was saying that he was going to be leaving them soon. And when you study it out, you'll find out the reason that he left it, John chapter 14, 15, 16, was so that the Holy Spirit could come and be a part of the believer's life, be our life. And he said, yeah, I will not eat this covenant meal again. You will eat it many times to remember what I'm doing. But I'm going to reserve this moment as the last time I eat it with my church. And the day will come when I will eat again in heaven when they're all there with me. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Now, of course, the disciples had no idea what he was talking about at that moment. But we today can look back at it and know the powerful thing that Jesus has said. Isn't that amazing? That he would eat with his disciples before his death. They were not yet Christians. But then through his death and resurrection, they would come to know him. But he says, I will not eat this covenant meal again until you are all complete and with me. Hallelujah. And then verse 26 is quite interesting. It says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. When they had sung a hymn. Well, the same way I asked, what is eternal life? If I had to ask you, what is a hymn? Well, it's not a her. <laughs> but it's H-Y-M-N. If I gave the mic to people and asked them, what is a hymn? I'm sure we'd again hear different explanations. And those explanations will be influenced by our traditions. Where we come from. How we were brought up. Because people have got different ideas of a hymn. And different ways of singing a hymn. It's different, you'd say, well, you know, is this a hymn if I play this song? You'd kind of go, I'm not sure, is that a hymn or not a hymn? Maybe if I play another song, oh, that's definitely not a hymn. Well, then why is that a hymn and that's not a hymn? Because generally, if I speak traditionally, we think of him as something quiet, subdued. And sometimes in our traditions, uh, here where we talk about you know, we don't take on labels. We are Christians. Someone came and asked me one day, what denomination are we? What's our tradition? And I said, Christian. We are children of God. Amen. Amen. Yeah, but are we this or that? And really, when you come down to labels, I don't, you know, labels are good if you're wanting someone to understand something, but it can also box you in. And I want to be very cautious. I'm never boxed in by certain labels. And we can think of the type of praise and worship that we have yeah, with exuberance and drums and all that sort of thing. Say, well, that's not really a hymn. Because traditionally, a hymn is more quiet. Maybe with an organ. And, you know, now I'm not sure they had an organ at this last meal. I'm not sure there were any chorus books at this last meal. So what is a hymn? Well, the word hymn is a translation of the word Hallel, H-A-L-L-E-L. -L -L. It's the Hebrew word. So hymn was brought into the Greek and then into English. The original Hebrew word is H-A-L-L-E-L. -L -L. And when you say Hallel, you are referencing, when a Jewish person speaks of Hallel, they're referencing the Psalms of praise from Psalm 113 to 118. Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. These are the psalms that would be sung over Passover. Pesach. They are the Pesach psalms. And so it's where we get the word hallelujah. 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 Everyone say hallelujah. And what is hallelujah? Well, there again. Hallelujah, brother. Hallelujah. It's got to be said a certain way. No, see, again, that's tradition. What does halal ya mean? Ya means God, the Lord. Halal means praise. It's an exuberant praise. Halal ya, hallelujah, 
is a shout or song of praise or thanks to God. In fact, the word, the root word for hallelujah, of the re- root word of the word halal, the root word here yeah, is halal, H A L A L. It's a Hebrew word. Not talking about the food. <laughs> this is a Hebrew word, H A L A L. Halal, the translation of halal, the definition, put it that way is to shine or flash, to praise, to act like a fool or madman, to celebrate with exuberance, clamorous, loud, to boast in and of the Lord, and the understanding is it's intended to be intense. Do you want to hear that again? We need to renew our minds and flush out some of the traditions. To shine or flash. To praise. To act like a fool or madman. To act like. Don't be a fool. (laughs) To act like a fool or madman. To celebrate with exuberance, clamorous, loud, to boast in and of the Lord. The understanding is it's intended to be intense. That's where that shine comes from. Flash, like a flash of lightning. You know it happened. Amen. Now, does that mean we can't be quiet? Yes, there are times. Be still and know that I'm God. There are times of intense intimacy in worship. We understand that. But when they sang here, it was a Passover. It was a celebration. What is eternal life? Every year throughout the world, We celebrate Easter remembering the awesome price Jesus paid on the cross. Some people may say, well, it means we're going to live for all eternity. It means I'll go to heaven when I die. All these things are true. What truly is is eternal 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 life. life. In this life-changing series, you will discover why Jesus paid such an awesome price. We will be in hell. Will we we live for eternity? Yes, 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 yes. Are our sins forgiven? forgiven. Yes, but why? You will learn about all the amazing things Jesus died to give you. This is what Jesus paid for. This is what He gave His life for. So that I may know God. And you will deepen your understanding of God's amazing love for you. This is eternal life you may know him. Get your series today by contacting us here at Allen Bag Ministries. Wasn't that encouraging? What is eternal life? Now that message is part of a series that dad did on Passover. I really want to encourage you to get the full teaching to just continue building your faith, especially over this time of the year. Now friend, Do you have eternal life? The Bible says there is a way for us to be assured of eternal life. Let's pray this prayer together and be sure. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son to die for me. I believe he died and rose again. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Be my savior. Right now, I believe I have eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, you have eternal life. How amazing. Now, Dad has a gift he would like to get to you. It will just encourage you and continue building your faith. So contact us at these details, and we'll be sure to get that to you as soon as possible. Well, that's all we have time for today. Join us again as we learn more about Passover. I'm Brittany. And remember, Jesus is Lord. Life is a choice. Choose life. Were they called to equip believers to flourish in their ministries? Alan and Janine Bagg are the senior pastors of the Bay Christian Family Church, one church in many locations. Many locations, one church, one vision. It is one church, multiple locations. 
Alan and Janine Bank invite you to join us this weekend at the Bank Christian Family Church for some great times of worship in God's amazing presence, for faith-building messages from God's uncompromised Word, and for some great times of fellowship with the family of God. You can join us in the Helderberg at these times at Section 3 Gan Center on the corner of the N2 and Fabric Street in Somerset West. If you're in the Cape Town City Center, join us at these times in Salt River on the second floor at 97 Durham Avenue. If you're in the northern suburbs, you can join us at Durbanville Live at these times on the first floor of the Durbanville Conference Center found at 27 Wellington Road. If you would like to join us at Par Live, we're on the first floor of the Berlin Center on the corner of Optonhorst and Berlin Streets. You're also welcome to meet with our family in Claymont in the Claymont Community Hall on Main Road. People connecting with people. Wherever you're able to, join the family at the Bay Christian Family Church this weekend for amazing times in God's presence and faith-building times in God's life-changing Word. If you're nowhere near any of our locations, feel free to participate in our services by joining us online at alanbagministries.org. Alan Bag Ministries is making the series that featured as this week's Wisdom for Life programs available to you for purchase. If you missed any of this week's programs or if this week's Wisdom for Life programs have helped you, we encourage you to purchase the series featured on this week's Wisdom for Life programs and have them available to strengthen your faith when needed. The series featured as this week's Wisdom for Life programs is available in digital format. So purchase yours online at allenbagministries.org or contact us to order your series at any of these details.